Well, I'm sure most of you are aware of the global warming drum pounding that has gone on. Typically in the media, you can see this coordinated effort whenever there was going to be another summit like the one we recently had. Immediately the media drums, boom, bam, boom, bam, boom, bam. I saw one by the Union of Concerned Scientists, an article which was a meta study of the studies that had been done showing that the majority of the climatologists believe that there is anthropogenic global warming, blah, blah, blah. Of course, what it didn't point out was the studies are under question <laughs> because of the methodology. So this was a meta study of studies which themselves are probably flawed. And all of this is designed to achieve a political result. It has nothing to do with the scientific result and furthering the knowledge in certain areas. We had something very important happen February of this year, 2016, but uh, very few people seem to have noticed and in reality, the global temperatures are probably going to go exactly the opposite of where everybody is proclaiming. Remember that ever since the IPCC was created, we always hear pronouncements about this is our last chance to save humanity or to save the planet. They keep moving the last chance date to save things. But there are other dates that are actually factoring in. And as we said in an interview we did, I think last year on the program, the solar activity is much more key in determining where our temperatures are going to be in the very near future than anthropogenic global warming ever will be. So I thought it was time to get John Casey back on. He's president of Veritense Corporation, which is a Florida-based science consulting company and author of Dark Winter, How the Sun is Causing a 30-Year Cold Spell, which I always think about the winters at Valley Forge when Washington was there in the 1700s, when it was so bitter cold and we were finding ourselves in a minimum then. What was this milestone that we passed in February this year? A very important milestone, John. The Turnover of the 206-year solar cycle that previously gave us global warming and has now turned around to reverse to global cooling it has reached a peak of warming. And from here on out, for the next 15 years, we should see rapidly declining temperatures until we reach the bottom of the so-called solar hibernation. This occurs once every 206 years when the Earth gets very cold. In February, we can look back on, I believe, in future years and say that was the warmest month and it won't come again potentially if you extend the 206-year cycle out a couple iterations. It may be the warmest month that we will see for 400 years. Yeah, the whole cycle you said smoothed out back between 2007 and 2010. And, of course, everyone pounding the drums for AGW have been very hard to explain or hard-pressed to explain 19 years of relatively flat temperatures. And usually when you see these articles saying, see, it really has continued up, we're talking about fractions of degrees here and things, you know. So they're hard-pressed to explain that. Absolutely. And, in fact, if you look at all of the predictions that came out of the UN Global Climate Reports echoed by our own current Obama administration science agencies, we see the same mantra that as long as CO2 goes up, the planet can only get warmer. In fact, that has been disproved now on very substantial bases for some years. The point you just mentioned is simply one of them. Even though CO2 continues to go up, and it should, we nonetheless have had no global warming for at least 15 and some say 19 years now. That's quite a statement of refuting the greenhouse gas theory in and of itself. And it means that most of the time over the last almost two decades that we have heard about global warming, there has been none. All right, what are we expecting to see now? You talk about a 30-year cooling period, and like I mentioned, I remember the Maunder Minimum back in the mid-1700s. Winters were so bitter when we were fighting the Revolutionary War. What can we expect to see? Does this happen all at once, or is it just a long slide down to a predicted date? It is a long slide, but whereas it took most of the 200 years to build up the warming, the drop into the cold solar hibernation, the next cold climate, is fairly steep. The next two solar cycles, solar cycle 25 and 26, began in three years. Myself, having been one of the early predictors for a decline in solar activity, have now been joined by most of the professional scientific and solar physics community saying the same thing, namely that for the next 30 years, 22 to 30 years, we'll see record low energy output from the sun. 
In turn, that means that the earth will get colder, and crops that depend on that warmth will start to suffer as the cold seeps in. Yeah, you can see the political and other ramifications. It would almost seem like if what your predictions are holding to, and like you say, these predictions are actually holding compared to some of the others that we've seen, you would think we'd want to be pumping all the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere we possibly could to counteract it, you know, to keep the temperatures from getting that cold. And instead, we're running in the opposite direction, which is really, well, we're running in the opposite direction in a lot of things, to be honest with you, of where we need to run. What does this mean? Let's frame this for people. So are we looking at another Valley Forge type of scenario? Clearly, we're looking at cold temperatures of the type we had from 1793 to 1830. My Russian colleagues tell me that I'm actually too warm on the forecast, that they say it will be much colder. In fact, they're predicting a new little ice age and, in fact, have said it's already begun. There's a lot of reason to believe they may be correct on that, although I have not officially accepted their theory. In essence, if you look at the bitter record cold and snow we had in the winter of 2014, and look at this April, we're getting cold and snow records broken here in the U.S., and right now Great Britain is undergoing dramatic cold and snow events, much out of season. These are simply indicators of what's coming. The North Atlantic, for example, the North Atlantic Ocean that drives the weather for Europe and Russia and carries over to China is dropping steeply in temperature and has been since it peaked a few years ago. We're looking at historic drops in temperature for the North Atlantic that bodes ill for winter weather and crop harvesting in the future for Europe. How effectively, now that you mentioned crops, let's look at, say, for example, Canada. Will the growth lines move further south over this time? No question they will. This will be a global event, not a U.S.-only or Europe-only event. We should anticipate that the next cold air will drop global temperatures 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit in our main crop-growing regions in the mid-latitudes, both here in the U.S. and in Europe. That may not seem like a lot, but that is truly devastating temperature drop on average for our major crop growing regions. And if you go back and look at history, every time this 206-year cycle has come around, the very same effects have been witnessed. Dramatic cold for two to three decades and dramatic loss in global crop production. And of course, that creates a lot of political instability as well, if you recall. No question about it. If you uh, look back just the last iteration in that frame I mentioned, 1793 to 1830, we had a war right here in the U.S. with the second war we had with Great Britain. And there were wars throughout Europe during this time, uh, the Napoleonic campaign. Napoleon made a terrible mistake of launching a winter offensive in Russia during one of the coldest periods on the planet, historically speaking. So, the so-called war cycle seems to be much aligned with the cold climate cycle, and we should be prepared for a lot of stress for the human species in the next 30 years. Yeah, it was Ibn Browning and his daughter Evelyn Garris that came out with a book back in the 1980s called A Past and Future History, in which they simply corroborated cycles, including solar cycles and everything else, and they were able to predict things based on cycles. And they said that the Earth politics tends to follow Earth climate changes rather than the other way around. So when the periods of major wars, etc. Now, the other thing that is interesting is if we look at Earth changes, since I brought that up, what is the correlation between solar activity and earthquakes or volcanic eruptions? This one to me is strange. It, it is strange, but if you look at the science behind it, it follows naturally as well. Dr. Dong Choi, the director of research for the International Earthquake and Volcano Prediction Center, which I also head. It's a group of international geologists who are specialists in earthquake prediction. By cooperating with climate research and seismic research, we have proven that there's a very strong correlation between these cold solar cycles and our worst earthquakes and worst volcanic eruptions. Just look at the last solar cycle 200 some years ago. We had the worst ever series of earthquakes recorded here in the United States in the New Madrid Fault in the central Mississippi Valley. 
At the same time, we had the worst ever recorded volcanic eruption in Indonesia in Mount Tambora in April of 1815. That volcano, which was 100 times more powerful than Mount St. Helens that erupted here, spread dust around the world, led by some accounts to deaths over 600,000 people, and created what we know as the year without a summer here in the U.S. in 1816, where we literally had snow in the middle of summer in August in the U.S. Yeah, I remember that. It was called the, uh, what was it, the year without a summer. Year without a summer, yeah, right. I remember that. And they kept waiting for summer to arrive, and crops, and it just never arrived. Never did. Kept killing any crop they planted, and uh, many people starved and froze to death here in the U.S., thousands, in fact, during that period of time. Now, the U.S. wasn't very old, wasn't very large. We only had 5 million citizens at that time. Yet it was a devastating event during a time when most people grew their own food. They had lots of wood for fireplaces. Imagine what would happen now where we have well over half of our population living in cities with no ability to feed or keep themselves warm if things really went south. It's really bizarre. Remember what I said about running in the wrong direction? You know, for the foreseeable future, liquid fossil fuels and related things will be our main source of energy, natural gas and fossil fuels. It's going to be another 10 or 20 years before we can get all of the alternatives really well running to the point they can power various sources of energy on a commercial basis. And so you'd think we want to be doing everything we could to get ready for that. Instead, our global politicians are running around trying to tax it out of existence tax it out of existence and fostering this myth that mankind not only causes climate change, but we can, as humans, control the Earth's climate. So we're looking at governments to have us totally upside down in the science standpoint and going in the, absolutely the wrong direction in terms of what we need to do to prepare for the next 30 years of cold weather. Do the climatologists who work on some of the models that we predict, I mean, we're looking at NASA and, and other organizations, when they did their models on AGW, did they factor in solar changes or did they assume solar output to be constant? More the latter. In fact, early on, back in the first report in 1990 that came out of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the role of the sun was completely dismissed and has been ever since. This is an unbelievable statement, but points to the greatest fraud in scientific history, in my opinion, which is the use of the greenhouse gas theory for political change. The greenhouse gas theory could only work if you eliminate all the other major changes of climate variation. So the sun was eliminated at step one. Water vapor was then eliminated, and many other factors that forced people to think only that mankind's CO2 led climate were used in these reports. And those are the fundamental yet major flaws in those reports. So those of us who believe that the sun and have proven that the sun controls climate continue to try to get our people prepared, get our government and our media aware, and get us back on the right track. You're fighting the same fight that I can't remember the scientist is that's been testifying before our Congress and the Canadian Parliament on the dangers of EMP, which he said it's just a matter of when it will happen, not if it will happen, especially if there's a coronal mass ejection of some type like we had in the 1800s. And he said, you know, we need to fix our grid before it just completely knocks us out of the ballpark. And so I think you're fighting that battle. It's going to be interesting to watch the AGW crowd pound the drums as we slide down the temperature scale. Absolutely. They'll come up with whatever excuse they can to continue to try to say that mankind controls the climate, even as we're shivering in our homes in the next cold era. You know, you do make me a little nervous because the magma chamber under Yellowstone National Park at the caldera there is larger by rather substantial measures than they thought before the echo soundings and it's also full <laughs> and i'm at the edge of what's estimated to be the 400 mile kill zone or something you know 